All right. So before we get into Gog Magog, I did want to go over the ABCs of salvation real quick. I think it's great to make sure that we have this in front of us all the time to remind us of our salvation and also to help equip us <coughs> to share the gospel with other people. Because the gospel is very simple. God did that on purpose. It's a simple gospel that even a child can receive. And us as adults, it's all about us coming to God in a childlike way. So first off, we have to admit, we have to agree with God that we're not perfect on our own. You have to be perfect as God is perfect. And no one except for Jesus is perfect. And so we have to admit that we're a sinner. All have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God. It's not about how good you are that gets you into heaven. It's about you believing on Jesus. So we believe on Jesus. Acts 16 tells us, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It's that simple that we are believing in him. Now, it's not just believe as, yes, I know he existed, because even the demons know he exists and they tremble. But they're not putting their trust in him. When we say believe, we say, I have put my trust and my belief is in you. Jesus, you are the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. And then that we confess our sins. We're repenting of our way and we're coming in agreement with God's way. So it's that repentance turning from our way and following Jesus and his way. So if you confess with your mouth, Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with your heart, you believe to righteousness, and with your mouth, confessions made to salvation. And so that is how we come into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And after that, he continues to change us. He continues to sanctify us. So it's a process that begins at that salvation time, but it's always him that does it. So we're not saved by grace and then we work for it to keep it. We are saved by grace and it's grace that keeps us following him and falling more and more in love with him as we do that. So the agenda for today, today we're going to look at the Gog Magog War. We're going to start with Ezekiel 37, looking at the setting up of what's going on in those scriptures and then we'll look at the actual war in 38 and 39 and then next week we're going to look at the kingdom of heaven so we'll look at what the kingdom of heaven is here on earth and then also what we have to look forward to in heaven you know what the kingdom will be like what we what we have to look forward to the bible actually says quite a lot about it and then week eight, we're going to go, we're going to look into being grafted into Israel. So we'll look at the difference biblically from Gentiles, from the bride of Christ and Israel. We have different roles. We are different sets of people. And understanding that really helps to understand the Bible as a whole, but especially prophecy, understanding who is who. All right. So the Gog Magog War. This is a war that I think we're seeing the beginning stages of it being set up even now. Um, some people believe that this war could happen before the tribulation starts. And then there's a lot of convincing evidence that this could actually happen at the beginning of the tribulation period. So it's one of those things that we may actually get to see it start to happen, or we may get to see it happen uh, before we're raptured, or it may happen after the rapture of the church. So, but we need to set the stage to fully understand what's happening in Ezekiel 38 and 39 with the Gog Magog War. We actually need to go back to Ezekiel 37. And this really helps to set the stage for what's happening and also helps to really underline a lot of what we looked at these weeks as far as the nation of Israel being restored. And so to best understand, we we look at this war is going to be future fulfilled, and I believe in the very near future. Uh, but we have to go back to seeing in Ezekiel 37, Ezekiel's dry bone prophecy. And so the hand of the Lord took Ezekiel to a valley of dry bones. And so he saw these dry bones and like, how could these live? They're, they're dried up, they're waste. And then Ezekiel saw God bring Israel these bones representing Israel back to life. 
and it states that this will happen in the last days. And, you know, the time clock for the last days is Israel, the nation of Israel. 1948, the clock began. And now, and now Israel is, is nearing um, or is 73 years old. So he'll bring Israel back to life in the last days and he'll take two divided nations. Because remember, it's the Israel, when they went into the Babylonian captivity, I mean, Daniel talked about this. At first, Israel was one nation. And then because of disobedience, God divided them into two nations, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. In Babylonian captivity, only Judah came back. We have now seen since 1948 that it's not just Judah returning to Israel, but it's the 10 tribes. Of, it's all tribes of Israel as well. So the northern and the southern kingdom are in the process of returning to Israel right now. They've actually had to limit it to only 200 um, people being able to return to Israel every day. Now, if you really stop and think about that, that's 200 people returning to Israel as their homeland daily that they had to limit it to because they didn't know what to do with all the people, all the Jewish people returning, not just from the tribe of Judah, but from the lost tribes as well returning to the nation of Israel. This is exactly what God said would happen in the last days. So we're seeing this fulfilled on a daily basis. So he's bringing back to life in these last days. He's taken the two divided nations and he's bringing them back together as one. And scripture says that they'll be under one king forever. So we're seeing the beginning processes of this. So let's see how God actually words it in Ezekiel 37. And so this is Ezekiel speaking, the, the um, angel is showing him these things. So then he, the angel, said to Ezekiel, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, thus says the Lord of God, behold my people. I will open your graves and cause you to come out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And you will know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O oh my people, and brought you up out of your graves and shall put my spirit in you and you shall live. And I shall place in your land, I'll place you in your land, in your own land. And then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and have performed it, says the Lord. And so if you look at pictures from the Holocaust, it looks like a valley of dry bones. You know, there's pictures of the Holocaust that are horrific because they're, they're pictures of huge mass graves with just bodies. There's... Um, Holocaust museums where in, in ostrich you could go there and you can see that they'll have rooms full of um, hair that they took off that they took off the, the people when they were gassed. They took their shoes, they took their they what how horrible the Holocaust was. And you see this picture from that of this valley of dry bones, the near extinction of a people. And that's exactly what Hitler wanted to do. He wanted to completely eradicate them. But God used that as a way to bring them back to their own land from death. He brought them back to their own land. And so we saw from the Holocaust, it was the push before, um, before Israel became um, born again. It was a people with no land and a land that with no people. You know, there were hardly any people in Israel. It was a wasteland, but it bloomed when its rightful owners were returned. And so Israel returns to their land out of death. The Holocaust was the fulfillment of the beginning of this prophecy, the dry bones coming back to life. God brought Israel back from the dead Israel's the only nation to return after being dispersed. This is not a common thing for a dead nation 
a dead language. This is the only time that's happened where it's come back. And that's because it's fully God. They're the only nation in language to return from the dead. They are a mighty army returning to their land, but they have yet to receive the breath of the Holy Spirit. So the last part of that prophecy was that God himself would breathe into them and that they would that they would not only be back in their land and would be a great army, but they would be back in their land and they would actually have God as their king. And so this hasn't completely been fulfilled yet because this is still in the process of being fulfilled. But one day when Jesus returns, they'll recognize him. And all of, Jesus, and all of Israel will be saved when they recognize him as the one that they pierced. And he'll be their king forever. And so at the second coming, that will, that will completely be fulfilled. So it goes on to say this new man, the reunited Israel. So the Lord, the word of the Lord came to me again and said, moreover, thou son of man, take one stick and write on it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. And then on the other stick, write upon it for Joseph the stick of Ephraim and all your houses and your companions, and then join them together. Oh, sorry. Then join them together in one stick, and they will become one in your hands. And say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen. And see, they were, after 70 AD, they were, they were dispersed all over the world. He said, I'm going to take them from all over the world, whether they have gone and I will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. Again, that's what we're seeing happen right now. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel and one king will be king to them all. This is Jesus. And they will be no more two nations. So when they came back, it was only Judah that came back. Now all of Israel's coming back and it's not Two nations is one nation coming back. Neither they sh shall they be divided into two kingdoms anymore at all. Neither shall they defile themselves anymore with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. I will save them out of their dwelling places wherein they have sinned and I will cleanse them. So shall they be my people and I will be their God. So God is going to completely bring them back. And he's going to be their king and there'll be no more rebellion against him. So after the Babylonian exile, it was only the nation of Judah that had returned to Israel. So in 70 AD, um, they were again sent to exile by the Romans. So after, after Israel rejected Jesus in 70 AD, they were again dispersed. Romans took over Israel and they were dispersed. The Romans had a custom of changing the name of the nations that they conquered. And so they, they not only conquered the nations, but then they would change the name and they would name it after their arch enemy to try to not only conquer the nation, but completely remove even remembrance of the nation. So they would rename it according to their enemy. Israel's arch enemy was the Philistines. Um, there were no Philistines left at this point. They had been wiped out. So Rome renamed the nation of Israel Philistine. And that has been translated to Palestine. So there's never been a Palestinian people. That was the Romans trying to completely eradicate the name of Israel by changing the name to their arch enemy, Philistine. And so we see here, so God is now bringing back all 12 tribes. And we see here, these are, you know, the people from, from all over here, you know, it looks like we've got from Asia, there's, there's the, the 12 tribes have been all over the globe. And so God is bringing back people that had been keeping their customs for thousands of years. 
but secluded in, the, in their own community. So God says that he'll bring Israel back from the dead. He will bring back all of Israel, not just Judah, but all 12 tribes. We see that began to happen in 1948, and it's continuing to happen. David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they shall have one shepherd. They shall all walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt. And they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I'll make a covenant of peace with them. And it will be an everlasting covenant with them. I will place them and multiply them. And they will, they will never leave forevermore. So they, they're going to be there. Now that they are planted in their nation, they're never going to be uprooted again. The enemy will try. Satan is going to try one more time during the tribulation period to completely eradicate Israel. And God's going to put a stop to it. You know, we saw a, through Hitler, we saw a prototype of the Antichrist. You know, Satan doesn't know when, when these, all these things are going to happen. So he's got to have his guy at all times. And Hitler was his guy and he made a run for completely removing the people. Because if there's no people, God said, I'm going to return to the children of Israel. If you can kill the children of Israel, then you make God a liar. Well, even Satan knows he can't do that. But that was Hitler's purpose, was to try to kill as many as he could. But God used what he did to actually pave the way for them returning to their land. So that brings us to kind of the why. It brings us to the setting of the Gog Magog War, because we have Israel now returned to their land. We have the dry bones, an army of people that God has supernaturally placed and is supernaturally protecting even now. He's preparing their hearts. You know, he's already brought, brought them back physically, and now he's preparing them spiritually. As we said before, they're calling out for their Mashiach. They're calling out for their Messiah. They don't understand yet because they've been blinded in part until the fullness of the Gentiles. So they don't fully understand yet that Jesus is their Messiah but they will they will and so we see the setting here both the northern and the southern kingdoms are returning so the end time war of gog magog is ezekiel 38 and 39 so 37 the dry bones the two nations becoming one again and then ezekiel 38 and 39 we see the war coming so the word of the lord came to me came, again came to ezekiel saying son of man Set your face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Rosh, Mish, Tubal, and prophesy against him. So who is Gog? Gog and Magog are also mentioned in Revelation 20. Um, but this is a different war. But it seems like we've got some of the same demonic influences over these nations. And so Gog... Gog and Magog, they are going to come out at the beginning of the tribulation period. But then Revelation 20, these same spirits, this same um, satanically influenced um, spirit is going to come again against the people of God. And Jesus is going to just finish it. And he's just kind of like... And he, and he does away with it right away at the end of the millennial reign. So we've actually got two Gog Magogs here, but they're very different wars. So Magog is the actual land. So this is the land that's spoken of um, in Genesis uh, 10 to Magog was the grandson of Noah. So you see some of these names and the land is named after the person that settled it. So he ended up settling in the far north of Israel, um, so the land is far north of Israel. So it's the land um, about where you can see it here. There's Russia and um, up toward Russia. Russia is as far north as you can go from Israel because all the directions given biblically, 
you know, Israel is the center of the world. As far as God's concerned, Israel's the center. America's not the center, it's Israel. And so if he's talking about the North country, he's talking about North of Israel. It's all going to center around Israel here. This tiny little part that, that the enemy wants to destroy so badly. So, um, so the land here is probably returning to the name of the founding father. Rosh, Mishin, and Tubal are in modern day Russia and possibly Turkey. So we know we've got Turkey. We know we've got Iran. We know we've got Russia as vital parts of this Gog Magog invasion. So we continue here reading the scripture in Ezekiel 38 and say, this is the Lord God, behold, I'm against you, Gog, the chief prince of, of, Mekit, of Meshesh and Tubal. I'm probably butchering these names. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I will turn thee back and put hooks in your jaws and I will bring thee forth and all your army, horses and horsemen and all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya with them, all of them with shields and helmets, Gomer and his bands and the house of Tagarma and the north quarters and all of his bands and many people with thee. Be thou prepared and prepare yourself and your company that are assembled unto you and be thou guard unto them. And so we see here, God is saying that he's going to turn them back. He's going to put hooks in their jaws and God himself is going to bring them in against Israel. He's luring them in. And so here we see the nations that God says are going to come out here. Are their biblical names and we see where these are most likely on our map today. Rosh is Russia, is Russia. We see here Southern Russia, possibly Turkey, Gomer and, Tag and Tagarma, those are definitely Turkey, Turkey. Libya is Libya. Ethiopia is Sudan. Ethiopia, the Ethiopia today isn't the same Ethiopia um, from the Bible. Persia is Iran. And so we see, and we see a lot of these nations, these have um, radical Islamic leaders. <laughs> they despise Israel. You know, right now, the big argument here is that Iran is very, very close to having their nuclear weapons. They're very, very close. And Israel cannot let that happen because they know that Iran wants absolute chaos. And they, you know, they, they're trying to bring on their Messiah as well. And they believe that chaos will bring their Messiah in. So these nations were gonna, are going to come against Israel and we see, a, we see all of this being put in place right now. These are the very nations that are, that are coming against Israel right now with their words and are threaten, threatening. So after many days, you shall be visited. In the later days, and when it says the later days, it means right before the day of the Lord. It means the day of the Lord. It means the last days like that we are, that we're about to go into. In the later days, you shall come into the land that's brought back from the sword. And it's gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel. So you're coming back to the land that's been brought back. Israel has been fighting with the sword since 1948. They've had to fight to stay alive. And so gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have, always, which have been always waste. But it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. You shall ascend and come like a storm. Thou shall be like a cloud to cover the land, you and all your bands, and many people with you. Thus says the Lord God, it shall also come to pass that at the same time shall these things come to your mind, that you will think an evil thought. <clears throat> And you will think, I will go up to the land of the unwalled villages, and I'll go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls, and having neither bars nor gates, to take a spoil, and to take a prey, to turn thy hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited, and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations, 
which have cattle and goods and dwell in the midst of the land. Now, there's different thoughts about what this can mean. You know, in the later days, definitely this is something that has not happened yet. This is something that will happen. Now, whether if it'll happen in days ahead, weeks ahead, or during the tribulation period, we'll, you know, we will have to see, but we know it'll happen in the later days. It's when Israel is brought forth out of the nations. Now, Israel has been brought forth out of the nations. We know Israel's not going to go back into the nations because God says, when I plant you, you're not going back again. You're, you're staying there and I'll be your king. You know, It's like, bam, 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 when God says that. So it's going to be, um, so it has to be in the, in the near, near future when Israel is dwelling safely with unwalled villages. Now that's the one that people have some different thoughts on. Some people think that that could be even now, I, you know, I, I don't think that Israel would consider themselves dwelling safely or with unwalled villages. They have a lot of defenses, but it could be once the Antichrist has revealed himself and confirms this covenant with Israel and many. Like right now, as we see the Abraham Accords, those the ones that are making the Abraham Accords are not the ones that are part of the Gog Magog invasion. The ones that are making the Abraham Accords, they are more of the nations that are right around Israel. And these nations are very upset about it. Iran, Russia, they're not happy about the Abraham Accords. And so it could be that this con confirmed agreement that the Antichrist makes puts Israel in a place where they are at rest, where they really do feel safe, that they really do feel like they're in a place of peace. And that is the opportunity for the enemy to, to come in. So why do they do this? Um, scripture says that their reasoning is to take a spoil, to take a prey. So not only to come in and take the riches of Israel, but also to take the people, to defeat the people, to take a prey. And so we see that with, with radical Islam, to take a prey for the people. And then we also see that these nations, especially Russia, is in a hard place financially. And Israel has, just in the last 10 years, discovered massive natural gas fields. Natural, massive natural gas fields. And because of their discovery and they're able to provide for, for Europe, they're able to provide for, for those around them, they're actually taking business away from Russia. So this could really be a, a big part of why they feel like that hook in the jaw, being to go take a spoil, being to, to go in to, to help to, to do it for the financial reasons as well. But God's purpose is to show that he's God. God's purpose is to show Israel that he is all that they can depend on. You know, and think about it. Israel right now and Jews all across the globe are saying we want Messiah now. If this ends up happening after the Antichrist has come on the scene, the Antichrist has come on. He has been the answer guy. He's given Israel their third temple, which they desperately want. They're thinking, could this be the Messiah? Could this be the seed of David that we've been waiting for? These nations come in. It's not the Antichrist that protects them. It's God himself that protects them, shows his glory, and shows them who he is in an absolutely supernatural way. And so we'll continue here in Ezekiel. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish with all their young lions thereof shall say unto thee. So Gog, so Gog Magog, they are going in. They want to take a spoil. And these nations aren't stopping it. They're just saying, what you doing? Oh, you're coming to take a spoil. Okay. 
They're not taking part of it, but they're also not trying to stop it. They're just inquiring. Are you come to take a spoil? Has you gathered your company to take a prey? To carry away silver and gold and to take away cattle and goods to take a great spoil. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, thus said the Lord God in that day when my people of Israel dwell safely, shall, shall thou not know it? And shalt thou come from your place out of the north parts, you and many with you, all of them riding upon horses, a great company with mighty army. And you shall come up against my people Israel as a cloud covers the land. It shall be in the later days. I will bring you, I will bring thee against my land that the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O God, before their eyes. Thus says the Lord God, are thou he of whom I have spoken in the old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days, many years that I would bring thee against them. So we see here, God is bringing them into this war. He's provoking them so that he can defeat them. This is not only to show Israel that he is who he says he is, but it's also to show these nations that Allah is not going to protect them, that he is God. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is God. And he's going to defeat this enemy. You notice that during the, um, the tribulation period, you don't hear about Allah. You're not hearing about Islam. Like the revived Roman Empire is the global government that's pushing forward. So it could just be that this is how God weakens the Islamic armies that have got their sights on destroying Israel. So who are Sheba, Dedan, Tarshish, and the long, young lions? Who are these nations that say, what you doing? But they're not stopping it. They're not taking part in it. But they're also not stopping it. So Sheba and Dedan, that is modern day Saudi Arabia. So they won't be part of the invasion that comes into Israel. They won't stop it. But they'll be mildly protesting or mildly asking, why are you doing this? Tarshish is Spain or Britain, or both. And the young lions are the nations that have come out of Tarshish. So America, if we are around at all, would be part of that. That would be, that would say, what you doing? You know, so if we are in the picture at all during, during um, Ezekiel, we're just there saying, what's going on? You notice here, America is not part of what's protecting Israel. You know, this is one reason why a lot of scholars say that something has to happen to America before the last day, you know, before the, the tribulation, because we're, we're not in any way protecting Israel. God himself is protecting Israel. So these nations question, perhaps lightly protest, but they do not come to the aid of Israel or go against Israel. They're just standing by and watching it happen. Only God protects Israel. And so I did want to bring about, want to bring you to your attention too. Right here are some of those nations that are standing by represented here in the Abraham Accords and the coins that were made from that. So how is this army defeated? How is the Gog Magog army defeated? If no nations come, if it's not Israel itself that defeats it, what happens? So here God continues, and this is in Ezekiel 39, and it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come up against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. So God's bringing them with the hook. But even if he brings you with the hook, no one touches the apple of his eye. His fury comes upon his face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath, I have spoken. Surely in that day, there shall come a great shaking in the land of Israel. So that the fish of the sea, the fowls of heaven and the beast of the field and all creepy things that creep upon the earth and all men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. 
and the mountains shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground. And I will call for a sword against him and throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God, every man's sword shall be against his brother. And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood. And I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the people that are with him an overflowing rain, great hailstones, fire and brimstone. This I will magnify myself and sanctify myself. And I'll be known in the eyes of many nations and they shall know that I am the Lord. And so it's going to be obvious when he defeats them that God is God. Now, there'll be many nations, there'll be many people that are going to believe the great deception. Whatever that deception is, they're going to believe it. They're not going to turn to God because they don't want to. But no one is going to be ignorant that God is God. If they reject him, it's going to be because they want to reject him. He's going to make it very obvious who he is and that this is him. And so here we have um, a newspaper article. I think this is just in the, the spirit of what we see here, a terrorist that was attacking Israel said their God changes the path of our rockets in midair. This terrorist. <laughs> and so God has been in the business of revealing that he's protecting Israel, even now, even in years past in a supernatural way, ever since he replanted them in 1948, he has had his hand uniquely on that nation to protect it in a mighty way and that's going to increase more and more as as they go toward um the tribulation as other in the tribulation god will more and more protect them in a supernatural way the way he did during the exodus when he protected them in a supernatural way and we see a lot of the same imagery um, throughout uh revelation throughout um, other places where it talks about the tribulation a lot of the same plagues that happened uh, before the Exodus and in the Exodus, God is going to do again. But just like during that time, he's going to protect Israel and they won't come on the on the people. And so how is the army defeated? It is obvious it's by God alone. You know, God doesn't boast here about the army of Israel and what they do. He starts to do some supernatural stuff. There's going to be a great earthquake. Um, now, we know one of the signs of the end is that in these birth pains, there's there's more earthquakes. We're seeing earthquakes all over the world. They're, they're stronger. They're closer together. Those birth pains are going on right now. This great earthquake could just be a birth pain, or it could be part of the earthquakes that are mentioned in the book of Revelation. There are some crazy earthquakes that happen in the book of Revelation that completely move mountains out of places, they completely rearrange the um, earth. And so it could be part of those, or this could be a great earthquake that's part of the birth pains. There's gonna be panic and confusion. When these things happen, the, um, the armies that are coming against Israel, they're gonna turn on each other. They're not, and, and this has happened in the Bible. There's plenty of examples where God did that, where he confused the armies and they ended up fighting themselves or they ended up running away from an unseen enemy. And so there'll be panic and confusion and they'll actually kill each other. There's going to be pestilence. So there's gonna be, there's gonna be pest or there's gonna be disease. Something's gonna hit them that's gonna keep them from continuing to forward against Israel. There'll be fire and brimstone and hell. So Sodom and Gomorrah style attack is gonna happen on them. That's going to completely defeat them, completely obliterate them. And it'll be obvious that God is the champion of Israel. So, Another neat thing that we see here is how God cleans it up, his cleanup plan. And it's just amazing how all this stuff is, is there already. Um, Thou shall fall upon the mountains of Israel. Now he's speaking to this army, this evil army that's coming against God's people. 
he said, you shall fall upon the mountains of Israel, you and all your bands and the people that are with you. I will give you unto the raven, unto the ravenous birds of every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. You shall fall upon the open field for I have spoken it, this says the Lord. And they shall dwell in the cities of Israel and they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn your weapons, both the shields and the bucklers and the bows and the arrows and the hand staves and the spears, and they shall burn them with fire for seven years so that they shall take no wood out of the field to neither cut down any of the forest for they shall burn the weapons with fire and they shall spoil those that spoiled them and rob those that robbed them. This is the Lord. So God will send the birds to clean up the armies. And it's very interesting. And I remember, I think I mentioned this before watching a documentary about the migrations of wild birds. It's amazing the number of species of birds that fly right through this tiny little place, Israel. These migration patterns. And so these birds are going to come and they're going to devour the armies that fall in the mountains and they'll clean them up. And I think it's interesting to note too that Israel is burning these weapons for seven years. Now, some people think, well, since they're burning them for seven years, this has to happen before the tribulation or it has to happen before the end of the tribulation. Well, there's no reason why they can't be burning weapons during the millennial reign. There's, there's no reason why this won't still be happening after Jesus sets foot on the earth. There's just not. One interesting thing to think about it is for them to be burning weapons instead of using them, they have no need for them. Why would they have no need for them? They're, they have no enemies. They have nothing to be afraid of. So, you know, that's another thought that this war could happen, you know, during the tribulation or, or even, you know, even maybe toward, toward the middle to late part of the, of the, um, of the tribulation. So it's hard to know exactly when it'll happen. We just know it's an end time war and God brings these birds as part of his, as part of his um, cleanup of, of the area. So what about Damascus? Because a lot of times when you talk about the Gog Magog war, sorry, here I'm trying to move this so I can read what I wrote. <laughs> um, the Gog Magog war, Damascus is hand in hand um, discussed, uh, especially today when you see Damascus is a key hub for where Iran, um, Russia, a lot of these nations use Damascus to store uh, their weapons and and to store um, a, a lot that they use it as kind of their hub for their terrorist organizations. And so Damascus is a place that's getting hit on a regular basis by Israel. They're they're getting hit by Israel because Israel is is fighting this proxy war uh, there in Damascus. And so we know in Isaiah 17 that an end time war is going to happen in Damascus, Syria that Damascus will be destroyed. Now, if you look at pictures of Damascus today, it, it, you know, it, it's arguable that it is destroyed, that it's uninhabitable, but that's not true. It, it is inhabited, it's being used. Now, many people have, have fleed because it's not safe at all, um, but it's not uninhabited. And it did not happen and it hasn't happened in a day. Here it says, this is an end time war where Damascus will be destroyed in a day. That you'll wake up and Damascus is gone. So that sounds like a nuclear explosion, sounds like something that could be part of the catalyst that brings, a par uh, that brings upon the Gog Magog War. It could be that that is the spark that lights for the nations to really let that hook set in and go in together to fight Israel. Um, that could be what it is, but somehow um, it does seem to be tied to Gog Magog, this Isaiah 17 um, 
a, a hitting of Damascus, the burden against Damascus, Damascus's destruction. So um, in Isaiah 17, it also says that the nations will rush against Israel. So it's the same wording that's used in Ezekiel, um, which also leads to think that this Damascus will then be part of what rushes the nations in against Israel. And it also says that God will defeat them by chasing them off the mountains. So it's very unlikely that these are two different wars it's talking about at the same time. And that, that they're rushing against Israel and God defeats them off the mountains. This, this is most likely the same war just looked at from a different angle. And so God defeats them again in the mountains. So very interesting as we see Gog Magog forming, as we see a lot of the, in the news, even today, as you look at Israel, you see what's going on with Iran and how close they're getting and how nervous that makes Israel that um, we may see some, we may see some very interesting things happen uh, in the days ahead, or this, this, or we could just continue to see it build up and it, it may not happen until after we are raptured. So, but we, it is interesting to see things uh, line up. All right. <laughs>